Thank you, Jonathan. It's my privilege uh, to introduce our first Freedom of the Press Award recipient tonight, the lawyers of the media and First Amendment practice of Davis Wright Tremaine. In my uh, previous position as the editor of the Seattle Times, I worked closely for many years with Davis Wright attorneys. And like a lot of you out there, I had a love-hate relationship with my lawyers. I loved the legal work they did for us, and I hated when the bill came. But Lord knows we got our money's worth and more from the storied firm that grew up from a small practice up there in the upper left corner of the country to the multi-city firm renowned internationally today for its stellar defense of press freedoms. In fact, I had one experience uh, myself many years back that in itself rendered Davis Wright priceless to me and to the Seattle Times, and I thought I'd just share a little bit of that. It was February of 1992. For three and a half years, imagine that today, three and a half years, my Times colleagues and I had worked tirelessly on an investigation in which we would reveal in the very next day's newspaper that U.S. Senator Brock Adams of Washington State was a sex predator who had, among other offenses, drugged and raped women. At the time, this was truly groundbreaking and high-risk work, and we knew that the national story would be as much about us as it would be about Brock Adams. So over those 43 months, slow news, we had worked hand-in-hand -hand with Davis Wright lawyer Bruce Johnson, crafting a strategy to report and then to tell the story, and then ensuring that it would be bulletproof. At about 5 p.m. that Saturday, before Sunday publication, with the first edition Sunday deadline looming, Bruce looked over my shoulder at the ATEX computer terminal as we did one final meticulous review of a 6,000-word main bar. And then, just as I hit the send button, the story disappeared. <laughs> the moose, gone into the ATEX vortex, nowhere to be found. Of course, we had a, f a printout of that final version, not. <laughs> but at that point, there was no turning back. We'd prepared a dozen sexual assault victims for publication of the story that Sunday. We'd done our final confrontational interview with Brock Adams, who was putting together a counteroffensive. We called in extra pressmen and carriers for the anticipated demand for the newspaper. We had to publish now but we'd lost the story. Over the next hour, essentially starting from scratch, Bruce Johnson and I reconstructed that story, all 6,000 words of it. As it turns out, it wasn't all that tough. Between the two of us, we'd memorized every sentence. <laughs> we made our deadline, and the next morning after this expose was published, Senator Adams dropped out of the race for re-election. <laughs> This is just one personal chapter in the volumes that can and now undoubtedly will be written about Davis Wright Tremaine's six decades of supporting the media and defending the First Amendment. Over those years, they've represented hundreds of clients across the media spectrum, from the Los Angeles Times to the New York Post, from Microsoft to Penguin Random House, from ProPublica to Penthouse, from CNN to Netflix. They've focused not only defending us from libel claims, but on protecting our access to information, shielding us from subpoenas, fighting against restraints on our reporting, and spearheading legislation that amplifies our freedoms. We often take those freedoms for granted, but we might not have them at all, except for the lawyers of Davis Wright Tremaine. Consider courtroom access. Davis Wright's Kelly Sager blazed a trail during the O.J. Simpson trial persuading Judge Lance Ito to allow cameras in the courtroom and giving the nation a front row seat to justice and injustice in America. <laughs> Libel. Victor Kovner established a hallmark of media law when he got the highest court in this state to declare that what is included or excluded in publication is a matter for writers and editors, not for courts or juries to decide. Libel tourism, Laura Handman and Rob Balin won a series of cases establishing that British libel law was, quote, repugnant 
to our nation's First Amendment and leading the Brits to reform their laws to dissuade potential plaintiffs from going overseas to file libel suits against American journalists. Sealed records. Davis Wright attorneys have battled heroically against the sealing of court records and government documents, including the unsealing last year of Trump University documents that for years had been behind a legal veil. <laughs> subpoenas. Davis Wright has quashed countless subpoenas and search warrants of reporters over the years, including the Trump administration's first subpoena of a journalist issued just two hours after Attorney General Sessions was sworn into office. And finally, legislation. Davis Wright lawyers have drafted state shield laws, saving us from having to reveal confidential sources, and anti-slap laws protecting us from litigious harassment. In many of these cases, and dozens of others, the Reporters Committee has been side by side with Davis Wright Tremaine. We've been comrades in arms in a war we know will never, in fact, can never end. For their unceasing dedication to the First Amendment, for their unparalleled excellence in the courtroom, and yes, for one Seattle lawyer's photographic memory back in 1992, <laughs> it's my honor to present this Freedom of the Press Award to the media and First Amendment practice of Davis Wright Tremaine, represented by one of their most accomplished and respected partners, Victor Kovner. Wow. Thank you, Dave. It is a great honor to be asked to accept this award on behalf of my firm, Davis Wright Tremaine, and for all of us to share the evening's honors with true First Amendment heroes, our fellow honorees, the spectacular Martin Barron, the awesome Kathleen Carroll, my old and dear friend Paul Steiger, and of course, the late Gwen Ifill each of whom consistently has reflected our First Amendment values with great courage. And I want to acknowledge this evening the, that the publisher of the Seattle Times, Frank Blethen and his wife, Charlene Blethen, who have come in from Seattle for this event. The Blethen family has owned the Seattle Times since the 19th century, and we are so pleased that they are with us this evening. Frank worked with our late partner, Cameron DeVore, for even longer than the 30 years Dave Boardman worked as the paper's editor. As my colleagues know, the process of vindicating First Amendment rights and free expression is a team endeavor. Very few of us can do this alone or nearly alone, and thus it has been a source of great satisfaction to be able to practice law with such outstanding colleagues. When Laura Handman, Liz McNamara, Rob Balin, and I led most of our then firm of Lankenau Kovner to merge with Davis Wright in 1998, nearly 20 years ago, we found irresistible the prospect that we would be able to practice law with the likes of the legendary Cam DeVore and with his colleagues out west, Bruce Johnson, Dan Wagoner, and Eric Stahl in Seattle, Kelly Sager and Al Wickers in LA, Tom Burke in San Francisco, Dwayne Bosworth in Portland, and so many others. As Dave has generously noted, the achievements of our colleagues from the West Coast have been and continue to be daunting. In New York, we were proud that Davis Wright would approach us to establish a First Amendment presence in the East. They did so because we were already their colleagues in the field, having had a long history of vindicating the very same rights of expression on behalf of publishers like The Village Voice and iconic journalists like Nat Hentoff and Jack Newfield and Wayne Barrett as far back as the 1960s and continuing in the present with journalists like James Risen, authors like Harry Belafonte and David 
Axelrod, film makers like Laura Portress and, and, uh, and uh, Andrew Jarecki. And we know that among the reasons we were approached was our young, then young partner, the incomparable Edward J. Davis, who, as most of you know, passed away within the past year. Because we have always functioned as a team, I will ask that my many Davis Wright colleagues from around the nation, they're here this evening, including many Davis Wright alumni, some of whom have moved from counsel to client, I'm pleased to report, <laughs> stand up and be acknowledged by this audience for the collective effort that the firm as a whole has played these many decades. I don't want to leave without stressing that the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press and its leader, Bruce Brown, is not only an invaluable ally, but for any firm practicing it in this field, it is an indispensable partner. Its ability to intervene, to lead the fight in so many battles, on so many fronts, and assemble amicus briefs on behalf of press interests across the nation plays a critical role in our practice for which all of us are deeply grateful. Thank you.